My name is Paul Gilby, Chairman of the Wollaston Society and a trustee. This is a film about Wollaston made by the Wollaston Society. There is a bit of history, but mostly it's a record of what the village is like in 1991. A sort of snapshot of village life, the houses, industry and the pubs. But most of all, the people. The film covers the village area by area starting at the centre and working out. The most logical place to start is the church, where Keith Lovell and David Hall are looking at the architecture. It's just behind the wall where the lightning conductor My favourite bit is the, uh, the line of extreme decoration at the bottom of the spire, that corporal oh, yes, table. Yes. There's some very amusing um, details. Have you noticed there's a rabbit with very long ears Chris, just above just that, that little yes. niche and some other strange animal faces and some interesting flower decoration. And I believe in recent restoration work uh, they discovered that it had been painted white originally. Yes, that's an extraordinary thing. It must have looked, looked very startling, startling across, utterly across startling, the other yes. side of the valley. And the stone, almost certainly for the tower and spire, would have been brought from Barnack or somewhere in the Peterborough region. It, it has to be very good quality, of course, to stand up there without any concrete or iron yes. supporting it. Would that have been brought by barge down the river? Most likely, I would think, yes, yes. The church is not just a visual focal point for the village. It can play an important part in the lives of village people from the cradle to the grave. The present vicar is the Reverend Geoffrey Cox. I'd say that the train to a very good sales. I feel very privileged to be here. It's fascinating that I started my ministry as a curate on an LCC housing estate with no church and we had a dual-purpose church building, which has since become a parish after I left. I then went to a parish suburban that had only become a parish six or years, seven years before. I then went to a two-church rural parish that was only built in 1881. I then, my last parish was a town one, which was consecrated in 1851. I've now come here, which is 1219, is our, our first vicar. So I counted a tremendous privilege to live in a place that has so much history, to work in a church that people have prayed in and done all sorts of other things in, in relation to God all over those 700, 800 years and before. People are people and they're all different. Some of them are incredibly cussed, some of them are lovely, all of them are interesting. The one big difference actually between a town and a village is that in a town where you make a mistake, uh, you can avoid the person by crossing the road. In a village you keep seeing them and so you've got to be careful not to make mistakes. My vision for Wollaston is that at the end of I don't know how many years yet, no one in Wollaston will not have had a chance, uh, an opportunity clear cut to say yes or no to God. And one of the things I hope we'll do with the other churches is so work it that nobody is unasked. Uh, one event that involves all the churches is the Good Friday procession round the village and finishing on top of Beacon Hill, opposite the Cuckoo. The obvious vantage point for the cross to be erected. I 
say I'm a salesman for God, but I am. Except the difficulty is I'm not selling, I'm giving. But I am a salesman, I'm an insurance salesman for the next world, and as I sometimes say, people don't value the policy very highly because they don't put very much in the way of premium. Um, but both of those, it's merely ways of saying to people, think about it seriously. The little wind vane or flag on the gable end of the Priory Barn is an interesting survival from the old tithe barn that stood very near this spot until about the middle of the 19th century when it was demolished by Mr. Keep, who'd recently bought the Priory. Yes. The other surviving relic from that old tithe barn is the cornerstone in that hand gate there, which has a hole drilled through it. And tradition has it that that is where the maypole was tied to that to support the maypole when they danced the maypole on the old village green which is on the site of the tree now that was planted to mark Queen Victoria's Jubilee. Yeah. Of course when Mr Keep bought the building and looked at his deeds he found that it had been owned by the Benedictine Abbey so he assumed that monks had built it. What he didn't realise of course was that Delapre Abbey was a convent yes. and it was owned by, therefore owned by nuns so yes. all this business about the priory and Monks Road and Priory Road is really all a load of cobblers, as we say, in a shoe-making village. I often like to reflect that in this building where young people spend so much of their recreation time now, was it actually the first purpose-built school never in this that. village? No. It was in, I think, 1840. Yes, Reverend John, John Scott came to here. He lived at the hall, didn't he? That's right. Rented the manor house. And he was a man of means. Mm. He was concerned that there was no edu proper education for children in Wollaston, so he bought a pair of cottages. You can see when you look at them that structurally it's still two cottages yes. at the back. Yes. And he had them rebuilt and modified to form a schoolhouse mm. with a yard at the back. And that was the first national school for children in this village, 1840. Uh, and then uh, it was after that that it became a public house, the Cuckoo. Uh, and in fact, there were two pubs on this site, weren't there? Yes, we have the bell across the road, the site of the bell. This, I don't know how long it goes back, certainly well into the 19th century, and obviously took its name from the, its proximity, proximity to the church. Yes. yes, yes. It still has the signpost, doesn't it? Yes, that's the visible corner. there. And then, of course, it became a hairdresser's shop. I'm not sure what it is now. Just a private house, is it? Yes. Staying in the village centre, we move up the lane to Wollaston Hall. Built in the 18th century, it was home to the lords of the manor for many centuries. The house and all surrounding parkland are now occupied by Scott Barder. Good afternoon, Scott Barder. I'm Godric Barder, and presently the life president of Scott Barder, which is um, a company that came here in 1941 because of the bombing. It was started in the East End of London in the 1920s and pioneered in the synthetic resins. It is in fact owned since 1951 by the workforce. This was a move really as a result of the, the Second World War to try and create better relationships between people and to create um, 
kind of um, structures that um, don't hopefully lead to people pursuing greed and other interests that are damaging the world and the people in it and its environment. And deliberately it was called Commonwealth as uh, the idea is we hold our wealth in common. But it was not um, just only holding wealth in common and getting a better um, <clears throat> quality of life. It is raising the quality of life for, for um, other people because proportions of our profits go to other purposes. As um, I think is known in the village, we've helped with the village hall and other activities yeah. and hope we can go on doing that. And and we're very fortunate, if I can say so, in having this uh, very nice um, um, old hall and, and park to, to operate and work in. Lovely environment. I'd be very pleased to be able to be here and I would like to feel that we can contribute further to the, uh, um, the, 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 village, um, the village life because if it becomes a dormitory, if it just becomes um, a place where people um, go elsewhere to work, I think that would be ra rather sad. And I, I would like to see much more local um, activity and um, local culture being, being developed because I think it's only when people work in community that they can grow and develop as human beings. I think village life is very important for that. Well, I'll introduce myself as Ian Henderson, Managing Director of Scott Barder. And of course, we find ourselves in the research labs this morning. Scott Barder is uh, uh, an international company, uh, turnover about 71 million to date. 55 million of that, in fact, is based on product that's manufactured here in Wollaston. The total number of employees uh, in the group is now close to 500. Uh, 420 odd of them are here in Wollaston. Uh, Scott Varder and Wollaston I see as an example of what I would call a symbiotic system. Uh, I hope to think, I hope and think that uh, we actually live together for mutual benefit. We're very well aware that that brings with it the responsibilities. We have a commitment to invest here on the site to make sure that our standards are the best that can be achieved and that will continue. In addition to that, we uh, are visiting the village to attend the meetings whenever we're invited and we want to talk openly with people from the village. There's always an open invitation for them to come and visit us and to look around, learn about us, learn about what we're doing, see the benefits that we're bringing to the community uh, in a tangible way. My name is Pat Blackwell and I'm, my role in the company is Secretary to the Community Council, which is the elected representative body. The uh, Community Council is responsible for several other committees, one of which is the Sports and Social Group, which organises the pensioners' outings that take place twice a year. One is a Christmas dinner at Wicksteed Park and the other is a summer outing to various places. This year we're going to Rutland Water and then we provide tea, usually at Wicksteed Park, for about 400 Scott Barder and Wollaston pensioners. One of the annual events that Scott Barder organises is the Commonwealth Lecture attracting large audiences to this special occasion. But probably the best known Scott Barder building for most village people is the Commonwealth Centre. Built in 1959, it's used extensively by village clubs and societies for dances, dinners and social events. The Wollaston Society, for instance, uses the hall for its annual autumn fundraising meeting, with committee members preparing and organising the food and drink. Paul Gilby, Chairman of Wollaston Society. The Wollaston Society is a heritage society looking after the historical interests of the village. We have meetings, hold events, have outings, mainly to raise funds for the upkeep of such things as the museum. The museum opened in 1979 and has a wealth of artefacts, photographs and records, some dating back to Roman times. It started life as a congregational chapel back in 1752, and in later life became a warehouse before becoming the museum.
Part two takes us from the church and the centre of the village, Hickmire and the old cottages, up to the new developments around Priory Road and Prospect Close. 36 years I've walked uh, 270,000 miles and delivered uh, 8,640,000 pints of milk without the eggs and butter and cream and yoghurts, potatoes and bread. But myself and the postman were the last daily delivery, you know. Um, and we reckon we give a good service. You've got countryside, and you've got nice people. Some bit quaint, a bit old-fashioned, some of them. But the younger ones are gradually replacing those older people, you know, in the village. Uh, but the quaintness is nice. It's nice, a bit of old-fashioned. You know. I was apprentice at 14 years old with the Marks in Northampton, an apprentice bricklayer for four years at 10 by the week, 12 by the week, 14, and when I'd finished the four years, I got 28 shillings a week. And I thought, well, this is no good. Can't live on 28 shillings. So off I went to Northampton, found myself a job, bricklayers. Didn't last very long. I thought, well, I'll see if I can't find somewhere I work for myself. So anyhow, there's a carpenter in Wollaston, the old village carpenters, the Browns. He said, boy, he said, there's plenty of work at Wollaston. Why don't you come and live at Wollaston? So I thought, well, that's a good idea. So I had a look around, and I found this plot of land here, which was just all open fields. So I approached the farmer, and I said, what about a bit of land? He said, well, you can have a bit boy. He said it's four and sixpence a yard. So I thought, well, that's all right. So I bought this first plot here. And I said, I'll put a house up here and see if we can sell it. So my young lady that uh, I was caught in those days, she said, if you sell it, I'll leave you. <laughs> so anyhow, I built the house and up come Mr. Bill Griggs. He said, boy, I'd like to build it, uh, to buy this. He said, uh, what about it? I said, well, Bill, I said, if you do, I said, I'm going to get the sack. So I said, I'll put you on up next door. So he said, right. So I did. And I put him up, ass up next door. And from that day, we never got short of work. And then the next time, the next day, I brought uh, had Mr. Stewart over, and he said, will you build me one? So I said, yes, I'll build you one. And we built that house over there for 11, 1100 pounds. It cost 1100 pounds. Then from then, that day, Mr. Ray Griggs, he came along. He said, what about one for me? Just along the road. So we put one up for Ray, 850 pounds. 60 pounds a plot of land, 60 pounds. And it's there today. After I'd finished all this development along here, individual properties, I thought, well, we better get another idea. And I looked over the field, and I thought, well, there's a bit of scope here. So I went to see the farmer, and I did a deal for £8,000. And look at it now. We filled it up with about 40 houses, and they all sold like hot cakes. <laughs> Early in the year, we found Ken Mallard relaying a hedge up Red Hill. Well, I've been laying hedges, not full time, but periodically for about 40 years. I used to do it when I was youngster, weekends, Saturdays and Sundays for people. But I worked on the farm and I learned to lay hedges with an experienced hedge layer. The two of us used to be together and that's where you pick your tips and things up and that's how you learn the job, by doing it. I would say this hedge is about 60, 70 years old. I don't remember anyone playing it, not in my lifetime, but uh, the size this hedge has got like this, it must be 60, 70 years old. Well, a hedge like this, you're lucky if you can do uh, 10 to 12 yards a day. But on a, on a good hedge that's nice to lay, uh, a man can do about a chain a day, which is 22 yards a day. The ideal hedge, when you lay a hedge, the idea of it is to make a stock-proof hedge so sheep can't get through the bottom, you see. To make hedge laying noise is to side them up, both sides each year, but not take the top. 
and then they'll grow up straight, and then they're much easier to lay then. When you lay a hedge, there's always two sides to a hedge. There's a rough side and a smooth side. The smooth side against the arable field, therefore the tractors and machine and get closer to the hedge. But the rough side is always left for the cattle. At the top of Cobbs Lane, where it meets the High Street, is the original house and factory of one of the best-known shoe manufacturers in the area, R. Griggs & Co. The company's managing director is Max Griggs. R. Griggs & Co. was first started at the turn of the century in 1901 by my great-grandfather, Benjamin. At that time, the industry was very much a cottage industry. That is to say, he would uh, get all the pieces of the work together, would then send them out to people's houses, and then they would come back, collect it up for him to, to sell on. This type of work continued right up to the First World War. And then, of course, as things got more sophisticated, he decided that he should build his first factory here in Cobbs Lane. This is a portrait of my uh, grandfather, Reginald, to whom the company's name uh, it takes from R. And R. Griggs. Uh, this is a portrait of my father, Bill, and this is a portrait of my uncle Ray. Uh, Bill and Ray, of course, both being the sons of Reginald. Uh, Reginald uh, actually lived here on this very site in Wollaston, and uh, the, this house now, of course, has been converted into the offices. Uh, over the years, we've uh, always felt sentimental actually to this corner of the village being grandfather's house and for however big we've got and expanded we still keep our roots here in Cobbs Lane. Um, as far as the Dr Marty's concerned there's basically two main styles that's a plain boot and a plain shoe which really represents sort of 50 or 60 percent of our production. We've got a number of factories in the village on uh, numerous sites but in the village there's nine uh, companies producing various types of footwear uh, as well as components. Mainly, mainly, of course, under the Dr. Martin's brand, which has been our real success over those years. We developed the industrial estate about 1979. Uh, at that time, we were uh, a growing company and Dr. Martin's was very much, you know, a, a large part of it and we thought, well, for family reasons, it's probably better not for us to have all our eggs in one basket and perhaps a diversification into industrial units where we could then lease these properties to uh, other people would be a diversification away from, from footwear. Leaving Max Griggs' office, along the high street, the Methodist chapel stands straight and proud. Methodism began in Williston in June 1790. There's a record that a female Methodist was preaching somewhere in the street, and from that, those early beginnings, the church began. It wasn't until 1811 that Methodist services were actually held in the cottages, cottages that used to be built on the car park out there. There used to be rough cottages along there. They belonged to the chapel and that's where we had our chapel. Uh, it was in 1840 that the present chapel was built and from that you'll know that last year was our 150th anniversary, which went very well. Methodist people have always been a generous people in their time and in their money and whether it be local or whether it be national, you'll find that we in Wollaston play our part wherever and whatever we can. A regular event in the Methodist calendar is the annual tea for all the village pensioners, held in the rooms behind the main chapel in College Street. Friends and neighbours meet for tea, sandwiches and a natter before the tables are cleared for the evening entertainment. Always a full house with standing room only, some of the cabarets 
well, quite exotic. Further along the high street, the village hall is home to a great variety of village activities, like the nursery playgroups, dance classes, badminton clubs or wedding parties. Once a month though, the parish council uses the hall to meet and discuss the running of village affairs, under the watchful eye of the present chairman, Phil Jones. Elected every four years, the 13 council members meet every third Thursday of the month to discuss the published agenda. A lot of work is done outside the meeting, though, in the different committees that look after things like highways and lighting, playing fields or planning matters. One evening a week, the young and not-so-young members of the Tang Su Do Martial Arts Club meet to practice and train. The rather more gentle sport of indoor bowls is a very popular use of the village hall, but the length is ideal to lay down three artificial bowls lanes. The village hall has become one of the best used and most essential parts of village life. Not surprising in a village that boasts 3,000 people and 1,100 houses and numerous clubs, societies, sports teams and groups from babies through to the elderly. These cottages were the old workhouses. 200 years ago, all the residents had to have the initials WP stitched to their clothes. It stood for Wollaston Pauper. There's not many paupers in the high street these days. The next section finds us at the old bank cottages, opposite the drive down to Wollaston House. I was born in Yardley Hastings. I lived there for 26 years, and then I suddenly decided to come and work in, in Wollaston. I lived up York Road in the house I built for 26 years, and this house came on the market. And nobody wouldn't buy it. It was on the market for about two years. So I thought, well, I'll have a go. I'll buy it. So my wife said, well, what are you going to do with it? She said, I shall never live in it. I said, well, you wait and see when I've done it up. Anyhow, we, we uh, altered it, knocked about half of it down, which was comprised of servants' quarters. And uh, this is the result. So we've got five bedrooms, three reception, and the rest of it is as you see it. They tell me that all the stone was dug out of the field across the road there to build this house. But the, the design, I don't know where it come from, but it's not too bad. Well, a local lad, I decided to be a carpenter. Took an apprenticeship, apprenticeship with Browns in the village. Took me apprenticeship. Went to Wellingborough Technical College to learn the trade. Was taught under a craftsman and uh, after a while, when I'd done my apprenticeship, I decided to start on my own. I went and done site work for a little while, built up some money, and then I came down to Underwood Yard, took this uh, small workshop on, as you can see. Not very big, but it, it fits my purposes, because I make purpose-made joinery, one-offs, because I do alterations, renovations, and basically I like to do and, and carry on doing old work. Back in the high street, the news agents is run by Mr and Mrs Wibley. Much more modern and open plan than it used to be, the shop is one of several village shops selling sweets, ice creams, general provisions and newspapers. Video hire has become an important service over the last few years with a huge variety of titles on offer. Thank you. Yeah. We've been in Wollaston for eight years. Find it very pleasant. 
Next door we find a well-known village personality and cricket lover serving his regulars in the boot. Aubrey Green has been landlord in this pubmaster pub for nearly 25 years, taking over in March 1968 with his wife Jean. In that time he's developed a friendly and warm haven for his regulars and the pub boasts some of the best Skittles and Dominoes players in the area. Four pubs now remain in the village. Of the three that have closed, the Marcus of Granby was the last, finally closing its doors in 1955. Further up the road, another well-known house that, although they've now left, is still known to most people as the Swans. Running parallel to London Road is narrow Thrift Street, down one side of which is a long terrace of Victorian houses where in the last century men and women would work long hours as outworkers for the shoe factories. Keith is showing David where they used to earn their living. And here's one of the workshops they work from. It's a large window to give lots of light on the yes, as well. Yes. And then what's the chimney? And the chimney too, where they burned the lead a bit fire yes. during the winter to keep them so the tax didn't freeze on the tongue. Here's a little sort of one-off curiosity at the back of the houses in Fifth Street. It's an early 20th century purpose-built photographic studio. You can see it has a very large north-facing window and a skylit roof. And it was approached by an outside staircase. And do you see that little tiny window yes. in the corner? Yes. That's filled with the most wonderful ruby red glass that, that was the developing room. Really? I, no, yes. I think it was owned by a member of the Partridge. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Opposite the cottages stands the Trilon factory. From an initiative by Ernest Bader, the company was founded in 1966 as a cooperative and has grown from strength to strength, making resins and plastics for canoes, industrial components, decorative pieces and model making. Next door is Allison's Printers, run since 1979 by the Wilmers, and very successful it is too. The Wollaston Co-op has been on this site since before the war. In those days, there were individual shops for grocery, drapery, hardware and furnishing, and the bank. The butchery shop was added later. Four years ago, though, the overall area was reduced and all departments were amalgamated into one large store. Now it's a thriving modern supermarket, open six days a week with late-night shopping on five of them. And where would we be without the bakers? and that famous institution, the good old British Chippy. I think these uh, houses in College Street are probably some of the oldest brick houses yes. in the village, aren't they? Yes. They show all, all the signs of being the, the local handmade Wollaston brick. Um, you can see from the colour, uh, the, the stretchers, the long side of the brick is, is red, yes. but the headers, the short end of the brick, is dark blue because of the way they were fired in those primitive right. kilns. And it's, it's, it's local clay, you can see, because of the fossils of the gypsum that's been fired from the Jurassic Coast, probably made at the Grendon Road or the Hinnick Road brickworks, about 1850, I think. Yes. You can see the sort of tooling marks, can't you? The that's right. Hand, yes. They're yes. absolutely handmade. Yeah. And this, it's on a crescent, isn't it, called yeah. Lawson Crescent. Yeah. We don't know quite why it was called Lawson Crescent. It had its purpose-built shop one of the very earliest shops, I think, surviving in Wollaston. And not only that, of course, at the back, uh, there's evidence that it had a purpose-built cobbler's workshop yes. upstairs. We know this because the one window upstairs is very much bigger than all the other windows to yes. provide light on the, co on the cobbler's bench. Yeah. And, and the shop, of course, it, it was once a, a sweet shop in, when we were oh, lads, yes, belonging to Aunt Lucy Lucy, if you remember. Yes. And uh, now, of course, it's a betting shop. This house was built, in fact, by a firm of builders, village builders, Rivets. Now, they'd been in business for a very long time, hadn't yes, they? Yes, they'd been here since the 18th century, and a rivet built the first Wyoming bridge on the road towards Doddington, and I think did some repairs on the church steeple. That's right. I think they rebuilt the top a little bit, didn't yes. they? 
Uh, it's a very well built house, typical of, of rivet style, especially with the details of the woodwork. Very, very nice bay windows, good wooden detail there. You can see the same sort of detail on houses in Howard Road and Queens Road, which makes me think they must be um, some of Rivet's houses. And opposite Rivet's house is the Watts's house, another Wollaston firm. They were plumbers and glaziers, and I think they evolved from the firm of Lawton and, uh, in High Street. That was the chap, you remember, who mm. made that beautiful gravestone in oh, the yeah, churchyard. Yes. And I think they developed from Lawton's and became uh, plumbers and glaziers at the turn of this century in a very nice double-fronted red brick house with the shop included. Another good example of Victorian decorative brickwork is the parochial rooms in College Street, used by lots of groups like the Wollaston Preschool Playgroup on three mornings a week. And Wollaston Theatricals, where Olivia Hart is trying to get the show on the road. Wollaston Theatrical Society started about 12 years ago, originally by a, a group of people just wanting to do a village concert. And there was a certain gentleman in the village by the name of John Bailey who saw this and said that he thought there was quite a lot of talent in the village and why didn't we start a, a theatrical society? And so that's how we were born. Um, we've got a membership of about 50, uh, not all acting members, of course. There are people behind the scenes which uh, you never see. Uh, the stage hands, the ladies who make the tea, the makeup people. And they're all very, very valuable members, even though you don't see them. Uh, we also have a very good child membership. Uh, the children started originally by coming from the dancing school to help out with some of the musical numbers. And of course they've all grown now and some of them are teenagers and have still stayed with us. Uh, and we're very keen to keep them because they are our future. We do two productions a year, one in February and one in October. The October show is usually just a, a variety uh, program and we like to do a show of some sort in February. I mean this year we're doing Snow White. We have 246 children on roll from four and a half to 11 years of age, and we've got 10 and 10.6 teachers, 0.6 teacher being a support teacher who helps the full-time classroom teacher with her work. Most of the children do in fact come from the village, which makes a lovely atmosphere within the school because obviously all the children know one another and parents know one another and parents build up relationships with teachers. We've got a very established and committed staff, many of whom have been here for many, many years now. And so that's been a great strength to the school to have this continuity running throughout. I like to think of uh, Wollaston Primary School as being a school which is based upon good common sense, sound principles. We pay a lot of attention to children being able to read and write fluently, to be able to numerate. And so we fit them really for the next stage of their education. I like to think of Wollaston School as being a friendly, caring school. We've tried to develop a feeling of openness in the school where parents can come in and uh, talk to the teachers about problems or concerns that they might have with their child and for the teacher to share the successes that their particular child may have achieved during the course of the day. We think that praise and success are very, very important elements of, of our education that we offer because we believe that by praising children, by acknowledging their successes, then in fact they go on to greater successes. And uh, these we see as really catalysts to higher standards. So we like to think of our school really as being one where children can fulfil their potential as best they can. The building now is about 100 years old and um, at the time it was built the design really was such that uh, methods in those days were very different from the methods that we adopt today. Children weren't encouraged for example to uh, actually move about the school and uh, one distinguishing feature really is the mobility of children 
Uh, and also, of course, the noise level. You might be picking up one or two children in the background who are involved in the computer work or involved in their normal class activities. And we encourage that. We, we consider it a working noise to be important because it means that children are interacting, they're communicating with one another and therefore learning. I would say without question, all the people who work in here, right down to the caretaker and cleaning staff and the teaching staff, all enjoy the building because it's an interesting building, it's got interesting parts to it and uh, certainly uh, you know, it's an interesting environment in which to work. Some of the girls from the school come back to the school hall on a Tuesday evening as the first Wollaston Brownies, under the guidance of brown owl Cathy Betts. How she manages this together with her Methodist and parish council duties is anybody's guess. At NPS Shoes in South Street, Morris Campion and Mick Sutton are listening to Ray Underwood explain why NPS are called the Duffers. Well, you're been in the longest. How, well, how, long did, how did it start? Well, I think it started with a few men doing hand-sewn work, and then somebody went around the villages and trying to sell stuff. And it increased from there, and uh, I moved to uh, Thrift Street, and uh, where well, there used to be a dog house there. And, uh, uh, the quicker you say dove house, the quicker it sounds, more it sounds like duffers. Duffers. Yeah. And that's where the NPS 
got its uh, nickname from. For years and years, it's always been about 60 people working here. And uh, as you know, the production's oh, increased yeah. from uh, what, 1,500 a week. That's right. To how uh, many? Five, five and a half thousand. Five and a half thousand. Still rising. Still rising. <laughs> Still rising. <laughs> um, in 50 years, we've lost about three and a half days' work. Short time. Yeah, and that is not a bad, no, in not the a last, bad record. Uh, what? Two and a half years on, no, I think we've been working about a nine hour day, ten yeah, hour day yeah. constantly. Yes. Uh, we're still not doing it. No. <laughs> no, brilliant. Brilliant. In Holyoke Road, we have some very interesting between the wars housing, detached houses and semi-detached houses, and I guess these must be some of the first houses to have proper indoor plumbing. Yes. Complete. They have other very attractive features like the Art Deco windows oh, yes. with their typical sunburst and ships sailing across the windows. Ooh, very splendid. attractive. Some of the houses have somewhat plainer windows uh, opposite is a house with, I think, probably the few remaining crittle windows. That's yes. the metal framed windows that came in in the late 20s and 30s. Yes. Not many of them left now. No. Or double glazing, seen them all off. Yes. This must be the newest equipment in Wollaston now, then, the new. Yes, this has just been. Climbing frame. Replaced. And also, talking of newness, just after the war with the first council estates being laid out, uh, we, we had the first example of large scale planning of streets in Wollaston, and this is just round the corner from Green Street. The, various early, the earliest council houses at the bottom of Green Street on Hinnick Road, the first three which are pebble dashed, and then I suppose finances got a bit tight, and so we, we just had the plain brick which were painted here. And up there we, we have quite a, a good view up Stone Close uh, of, of well-maintained houses, and it was called Stone Close because of the proximity of the stone quarry, built on top of the stone quarry. Green Street was named after one of the councillors. Well, we're standing now in Hinnick Road on the site of the new St Alden's Place and we can see various styles of, of architecture. The oldest we can see here is the Ed Wardian over the road in Hinnick Road. And then going around at the bottom of Howard Road, you can see the interwar council yes. housing. I think that's probably about 1930, a little bit before. Yes. And just behind, again, some very modern development now, only a few years old. And here, again, quite close to us, we have something over two or three years, about 1989, 1990. This particular hall was built in 1957, but we have an extension at the rear of the building which was uh, built five years ago. We do occasionally get the odd mouse, which has been known to appear from time to time, but apart from that, um, we have a, a good, good set of buildings here, and uh, with the addition of our car park, that has helped considerably. The Salvation Army, especially at Wollaston, is committed to helping those people who are needy and oppressed. And they do that in a variety of ways, by our financial giving and uh, by practical ways as well. Uh, there's an interesting story that, that, that happened at the core here at Wollaston just a couple of years ago, whereby a group of Salvationists um, were committed to actually sleeping out in cardboard boxes and uh, through that sponsorship raised money to provide sleeping bags for the homeless people in London. The Salvation Army is committed to helping as many people as it can, especially the needy and poor, and uh, there are a number of those, as we know, in this country, even in this village. And we provide facilities here for old people to come and share a meal. We provide facilities for young people to come and to share our, our hall and our fellowship. And we also provide practical support in terms of financial aid to a variety of schemes that the Salvation Army run uh, nationally and internationally. Are you pleased to be here in the Salvation Army this evening? Yes. 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 Good. I'm really excited about this evening. I believe God's got something to say to each one of us. And I hope that we're here wanting to listen.
Youngsters from here and the rest of Wollaston meet a couple of nights a week at the Oasis Club in the Baptist schoolrooms. The driving force behind the club and the man whose mission it's been to get the kids and teenagers off the street and to find them a place of their own to enjoy themselves is Anthony Boddington. Oh, we've been in the Baptist schoolrooms two and a half years now, but we are, we're here for two and a half years. Now we, we're open now at the village hall on a Sunday night for over four teens. For children coming through on a Friday night, we average over about uh, 80 to 100 on a Friday night. That goes from the younger ones, under 11s, are from seven o'clock till half past eight. Then we split them up then, and the older ones come from eight o'clock till 10, quarter past 10. We would love to have our own building, our own, our own kitchens, our own uh, sports room, everything for the children for five nights a week. I'm sure the way the long-term building with the whole village, with the church, with the, the council, the parish council, are all behind me. And uh, we're having money um, or donations from all warps of people. I think we will get it, or know we will get it, but it might be in two or three years' time before we do. They're, they're fantastic kids. We're at no trouble at all. They just play me up now and again, which I don't mind. They, they're brilliant. Aren't you kids? Are you good? Opposite the Oasis Club and holding one of the most commanding positions in the village is the Nags Head. It was a disco pub in Big Bob's day and saw a lot of action, particularly on a Friday and Saturday night. Since the refurbishment, it's taken on a more dignified air and the bar and the restaurant do a very brisk trade. Down from the Baptist Church, the Wollaston Working Men's Club is one of the two affiliated clubs in the village. It opened its doors in 1898, having been a disused factory before that. Always busy and well used, it's a favourite watering hole for a lot of working people, partly due to the very reasonable prices over the counter. A large private room on the first floor is often used for parties, functions and children's discos. The Crispin got its name from the patron saint of shoemakers, St Crispin. One of the oldest village pubs, it started its life as a beer house, just selling beer to take away. In Victorian times, it would have been quite common to see a pan of frying sausages on the bar. In fact, there's a story about a man, a bit worse for wear, claiming to be the king of Wollaston, being hit over the head with the frying pan by a local farmer who wanted to see him properly crowned. The other affiliated club, this time along the High Street, is the Excelsior Band Club. During the day it serves as a canteen for Griggs workers and in the evening reverts to a popular club. The south side of the village and the Hinnick Road has seen great changes over the last 10 years. What used to be rolling fields alongside Wollaston vulcanising now houses a busy and thriving industrial estate. We started to develop this industrial estate about three years ago and it's probably about January that we actually finished it. We did it in two stages, this particular building being in the last stage we've decided that uh, we were so busy that we'd better use it ourselves, even though we intended to lease it out at one time. The track here is uh, capable of producing about 10,000 pairs per week. It's actually a double track, and we've got provision also for another two double tracks. Uh, so eventually we hope to be producing over 30,000 pairs a week just in this factory alone. So, you know, we, we reckon that all told we should eventually reach about 150,000 with all our other units. We employ as a company in total about 1,500 people, of which I suppose well in excess of 600 are actually employed within the village. I should think on average some of the better paid jobs are you know, touching £300 a week plus. 
who actually was a Dr. Martins. He was a German who, uh, around 1945, just after the war, in fact, he had a skiing accident, hurt his foot, found he couldn't walk normally in, in proper shoes. So, together with the help of a student friend called Dr. Funk, they developed an air cushion sole, which, uh, I mean, really, that, that was the first air cushion sole. The Doc Martin product has been extremely well received in all the English-speaking countries, um, also all over Europe, uh, in particular France and surprisingly Japan. The sample size generally for all, every other country is, is an eight for men, whereas for Japan it's a four and a half. We see the future, uh, really the, the, the big growth being in export. That's where we're going to really take off. We are still a family business and we hope to keep it that way. Fifth generation in fact, yeah. Got a young son, nearly three weeks old, so who knows. Following the Hinnick Road north and turning right up Shepherd's Hill, one of the four main local farmers has gone to check his cattle. The family's farmed at Wollaston since 1966, when they moved down here from Derbyshire and took Tower Farm, from the, uh, rented from the church commissioners. Tower Farm is now about 500 acres. It's very typical of the farms around here. It's m the main crop is uh, winter wheat. Then we grow oilseed rape as a break crop for the wheat. And I also run a herd of 90, approximately 90 suckler cows. Now, there are three principal farmers uh, in Wollaston now. The village, uh, the two in the village are, are myself and Clive Combine. Alan Shearer farms a similar sized farm uh, to mine just outside the village and uh, Peter Hutchinson who farms at Strixton also farms some land in the village yeah. and there's also a pig farmer and a poultry farmer still in the village. The acreage we farm here is about 850 acres. When, when I came here I'm told that uh, Bill Gibbard who farmed these three farms in Strixton employed 13 men uh, plus casual labour at harvest time and thrashing time. Um, we, we now do it with two, but um, we have a highly intensive uh, mechanised uh, machinery uh, to, to, to enable us to cut out the labour. Uh, the crops, we, we have about 750 acres of arable crops, uh, mainly winter wheat, and oilseed rape. I remember back in the 1950s, an average, a good yield of wheat per acre was two tons to the acre, and that was a damn good yield. Nowadays, we're looking for four tons, and really and truly, we need three and a half tons to stand, to stand financially level. Down the lane from Peter Hutchinson's farm is Strixton's church. Services are held by Geoffrey Cox, and once in a while a Strixton wedding fills the pretty little church. Wollaston Comprehensive is known by a lot of village people as the top school. A lot of junior school pupils graduate up here, but they're joined by many children who are bussed in from as far afield as Brayfield, Cookner and Yardley Hastings to the west, and Urchester and Higham Ferris to the northeast. Currently there are 1,100 boys and girls looked after by 68 staff all of whom at the moment are getting to grips with the government's new national curriculum. All pupils take GCSE exams in the fifth form, and on average about 120 of them go on to A-level, where there's a wide choice of subjects from sciences, through the humanities, to music and the performing arts. Each evening during term time, these rooms are used for a whole variety of evening classes, Wollaston has one of the largest adult education syllabuses in the area and people come from far and wide to learn about everything from watercolour painting to car maintenance. Of course the sports facilities are popular in the evening 
as they are during the day with the children. And these are the prize pupils from the class of 91. Outside the school, Bill Newcomb and Albert White are preparing for a sponsored horse and carriage ride. The RILB sponsor a charity each year for their fundraising events. They have sponsored the Oasis Club this year because in the opinion of the RILB members, um, it is time that somebody actually took action to assist the youngsters of our village and other towns and villages. And we are hoping that we shall set an example. The other annual event that starts from outside the school is the carnival. The playing field is home to the village's premier sports teams. Cricket and football, adults and children. The adults are all very professional, but the children can get tuition in cricket and football. And you never know when you might have another gazer on your hands. Right, have you split yourselves into two teams? Michelle! From Michelle, she's been in the sandwich. Well in. The Wollaston Vicks has a very illustrious history dating back well into the last century. During this time, they've won most of the cups in the district leagues and still offer any budding star a chance to play for their village team. So finally it's come to this, ball, flat, hot, hard bit of tarmac for the end of our architectural tour. Yes, surrounded by all these noisy cars commuting to the M1 or somewhere, and here we see housing development, houses built in about 1980, still some space left in the park up there, all of which contrast in quite a far cry from the medieval strips and Red Hill fields. They're unchanged, they're left as they were in 1788. But I wonder how much longer it can remain unchanged here. Yes. And what the future holds. OK, this is it. Why even shout? Now.